Okay, so first, thank, thanks um, to the FIPSAC organizers for organizing this conference. I am Tian Yi from UCSD. I'm going to talk about the harmonic basis for generalized covariant algebras. So this is a joint work with Brendan Rhodes and Zhe Hong Zhao. So in this talk, I will first describe the classical covariant algebra Rn and its harmonic space Vn. Then I will generalize the Rn into R and lambda. And I'm going to de describe the harmonic space of R and lambda and find a basis for that harmonic space. First, let's define this Rn. Everything in this talk happens in this polynomial ring where we have rational coefficients and n variables, x1 to xn. We can create an ideal in this ring. We, um, this is generated by these e1 to en, where ed is the elementary symmetric polynomial with degree d. So now we have an ideal called in. We can find this quotient that's called rn. But notice that there is an, S, an action on this qxn. This action is by permuting the subscripts. For instance, the one, two transposition can act on this QXN by swapping X1 and X2. Um, since this IN is SN invariant, we can say this RN is a graded SN module. People have studied this RN in the past. So Artin studied RN as a vector space. Artin said, well, all these monomials that can fit under a staircase, they descend to a basis of Rn. Shivali studied Rn as an ungraded Sn module. Shivali said Rn is actually isomorphic to the regular representation. Lustig and Stanley studied Rn as a graded Sn module. So they determined its isomorphism type. And their result can be summarized by the equation right here. On the left, we have the graded Frobenius image of, Fn, of Rn. On the right, we have a polynomial that's governed by something called major index. Okay, so that's Rn, but we are going to introduce the Vn, its harmonic space. So first, let's take out the polynomial f. We can turn this f into a differential operator. We just replace each xi by the partial differential operator of xi. So now we can define an action of qxn on itself. Let's say we have f and g. We can turn this f into a partial differential operator and apply this operator on g. And we can get a polynomial. So this is an action of qxn on itself. With this action, we can define an inner product. We first take out two polynomials, f and g. We let this f act on this g and get a polynomial. We can take out the constant term from this polynomial. So this is a inner product on QXN. With this inner product, we can define the harmonic space. Let's say we, we have an ideal called I, then its harmonic space is defined to be the set of, of all these polynomials G, such that the inner product between F and G vanish for all these F in this ideal. And a basis of V is often called a harmonic basis. And we know that if I is S an invariant, then this quotient and V are isomorphic as graded S n modules. This is correct in our case. So the I n defined above is of course S an invariant, which means if we let V n be the harmonic space associated to this R n, then Vn and Rn are isomorphic as graded Sn modules. So now we have two isomorphic um, graded Sn modules. We can study the, the Rn by studying Vn. But why are we doing this? Like why we are studying Vn, not Rn? That's because elements of Rn are cosets. Let's take out an element, say F plus In. And we can ask whether this element of Rn vanish or not. Well, this question is the same as asking whether F is in this ideal or not, which is not an easy question. However, if we are studying this Vn, 
its elements are just polynomials, not cosets. So we don't have some questions like this. So we can say Vn is easier to work with compared with Rn. And actually people have worked with this Vn in the past. People find that Vn is actually the smallest space that contains the delta n, the Benjamin determinant, and is closed under all kinds of partial derivatives. So here delta m, the Vandermont determinant is defined as the product of all these xi minus xj, where i is less than j. So we can view this fact from another perspective. We can view Vn as a qxn module where the action is by that circle dot. So from this perspective, we can say Vn as a qxn module is generated by the Vandermont determinant. We have another result about this Vn. So we can find all these monomials that can fit under a staircase. We let these monomials act on this delta n. The resulting set of polynomials is a basis of Vn, and it's also called a harmonic basis of Rn. Now we have studied Rn and Vn. Sean Griffin, the speaker who just gave a wonderful talk, generalized Rn to Rn lambda. So we have a few more variables here. First, we find a k that's at most n. And we find lambda, which is a partition of k. And we let s be the number of parts in lambda. Then we can define an ideal called i n lambda. I will describe the construction of this ideal in the next slide. And we let r n lambda be the corresponding quotient and V n lambda be the harmonic space. You shall see that this I n lambda is S n invariant, which means R n lambda and V n lambda are isomorphic as graded S n modules. So how can we construct an ideal like this? Well, look at this example. So here n is nine, k is seven, S is four. Lambda should be a partition of seven with four parts. Lambda can be three, two, two, zero. So here, notice that zero is allowed to be part of a partition. Now let's construct this i and lambda. So we have two types of generators. First, we have monomial powers. We just have all these xi to the s. We are now s is four, so we have x1 to the four, all the way to x9 to the four. We have these nine generators. We also have something called EDS. So here S is an arbitrary subset of bracket nine. And EDS just means this is the elementary symmetric polynomial with degree D using variables X, I, such that I is in S. However, for each S, not all the possible Ds are allowed. We only allowed a few Ds. So to enumerate the possible Ds, we need a diagram like this. First, we draw lambda i boxes in the i's column, which means we are drawing the first diagram of lambda prime. So we have three boxes in column one, two boxes in column two, and two boxes in column three. Once we have a diagram like this, we can enumerate the possible d's for each s. Let's say s has size nine. S is a subset of bracket nine with nine numbers, which means S must be bracket nine. If now S has size nine, we can enumerate the possible Ds by writing numbers in this diagram. We start at the top left corner. We write down the size of S, which is nine, followed by numbers in a decreasing order and rewrite in the English reading order. So nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, and three, these seven numbers are the possible Ds when S has size nine. And now let's say S has size eight. Well, we have to ignore the first row. So in general, for each number that is in bracket N, but not in S, we ignore one row. So here one number is in bracket nine, but not in S. So we ignore the first row. We start by writing the size of S, eight, followed by seven, six, and five. So these four numbers, are allowed to be D when S is an arbitrary set with size eight. Now, if S has size seven, then we just do this again, but now we skip two rows and the only possible D is seven. 
for smaller s, we just cannot create any possible d's. Okay, so now we have many eds together with these monomial powers. They generate an ideal card i and lambda, and you can see that this ideal is of course s and invariant. We let r and lambda be the quotient, and v and lambda be the harmonic space. And we can see that this r and lambda actually generalize many important rings. When lambda is a sequence of ones, then this r and lambda is the same as the rn defined above. Now let's say k equals n, which means lambda is a partition of n. And let's say lambda has no zeros. Then this ring, r and lambda, is also called Tanisaki quotient that was studied by Tanisaki and Garcia Prochesi. Now if, R, now if the lambda has some ones followed by some zeros, then this ring, this R and lambda, was introduced by Hogden, Rose, and Shimozono. They call this R and KS. They were motivated by the delta conjecture. So now we are interested in this R and lambda. We can study the R and lambda by studying V and lambda because they are isomorphic graded SN modules. So we need to describe this V and lambda in general. Recall that in the first case, in this case, we can describe the VN as, well, that's just the smallest space that contains the Vandermont determinant and is closed under all kinds of partial derivatives. We want something like this for V and lambda. To do this, we need some component hierarchs. Let's first introduce injective tableau. Um, we have the lambda, we have N, an injective tableau should have shape lambda prime, which means it has lambda i boxes in the i's column. And when we require no two entries to be the same, and each entry is at most n. For instance, if this is lambda and n equals nine, to enumerate an injective tableau, we first need to create a diagram with four boxes in column one, two boxes in column two, and one box in column three. I have a diagram like this. And I'm going to write numbers into this diagram. My numbers should come from bracket nine, and each number should appear at most once. Then for each injective tableau like this, I'm going to create a polynomial for this injective tableau called generalized Vandermont. First, let's say we have a subset of bracket n. We can create a Vandermont determinant using xi such that i lives in the s. This is called delta s. Now let's take an injective tableau t. Well, we can create a, a Vandermont on its first row, and we can create a Vandermont on the second row. And for each of its row, we can create a Vandermont determinant. And we also have these xi to the s minus 1, where i ranges over all numbers that are not in this t. We just have all these ingredients together and we multiply them together. We have a polynomial that's associated to this injective tableau. So here's one example. Let's say we have this injective tableau. The first row contains two, six, and five. So I can create a Vandermont using x2, x5, and x6. The second row has one and four, so I can create a Vandermont using x1 and x4 and I can create two more Vandermonts. Also, I see that seven is not in this tableau, and eight is also not in this tableau, so I can create x7 to the fourth and x8 to the fourth. They are raised to the fourth power because um, four equals s minus one, where s is the number of parts in this partition. So now I have a polynomial for each injective tableau, and our first main result is saying that if we just consider all these injective tableau T and find their corresponding delta T's, then V and lambda is actually the smallest space that contains all these delta T's and is closed under all kinds of partial derivatives. In other words, if we view V and lambda as a QX and module where the action is by that circle dot, then this V and lambda is generated by all these delta T's. So now we have a description of V and lambda. And for Tanisaki quotients, which means when K equals N and lambda, is a part, and lambda has no zeros, 
then this statement was first proved by Amber Zhuang and Garcia. With this description of V and lambda, we can have a spanning set of V and lambda. We just find all these delta t's and use all kinds of monomials to act on these delta t's. And this set is, of course, a spanning set of V and lambda. But what we want is actually a basis of V and lambda. So we can extract the basis from this spanning set. That leads us to this ordered set partition. So we still have the same setting. We have k, we have n, we have lambda and s. Then we let this set be the set of all these sequences. Each bi is a subset of bracket n, and each number in bracket n appears in exactly one of the bi. Moreover, we require bi to have size at least lambda i. So if n is 16 and lambda is this, then OP and lambda contains sequences of six subsets of bracket 16. Um, these six subsets should, should be pairwise disjoint. Their union should be bracket 16. And B1, B2 should have size at least three. B3, B4 have size at least two. So, um, an element like this can be represented by a diagram like this. So to draw such a diagram, we first draw lambda i boxes in the i's column. Then for each bi, we write, its, we write elements of bi in increasing order from bottom to top, and we can go beyond the boxes. For instance, if b1 has 3, 5, 6, and 9, I'll just write 3, 5, 6, and 9 in column one. Let's say the fourth block, B4, has only two and eight. Then I'll just write two and eight in the fourth column. If the fifth set, B5, is empty, then I'll just write nothing in the fifth column. I think this diagram is similar to, the, to Sean's diagram, except I just flipped everything. So now these numbers are not the basement. They are actually flying above the boxes. And if I'm using a diagram like this, then the requirement bi have size at least lambda i is the same as saying all the, box, all the boxes must be filled. For each ordered set partition, we can define something called inversion. Let's say we have a number i that lives in, an, that lives in a box. Then an inversion of i is just the number j such that j is larger than i, j is on the left of i, and the number below j doesn't exist or is less than i. For instance, 10 is an inversion of 8 because 10 is larger than 8, 10 is on the left of 8, and the number below 10, 7, is less than 8. So 12 is also an inversion of 8. And 3 is an inversion of 1, that's because three is larger than one, three is on the left of one, and the number below three doesn't exist. This is the definition of inversion when the number i is in a box. And I guess this is um, the thing Shang was talking about in, in the previous talk. Okay, and if i is outside of a box, then we define an inversion in a slightly different fashion. So now an inversion of i is a whole column the column should be on the right of i, and this column either has no boxes or its highest box number is less than i. Let's say i is 9. Then column 4 is an inversion of 9 because the highest box number 8 is less than 9. Column 5 and column 6 are also inversions of 9 because they don't have any boxes at all. So 9 has three inversions. We have a notion of inversion, so we can generalize something called lemma code. We can assign a code to each sigma in this OP and lambda. Let's consider this sigma. We can find a code such that the i's entry of this code is just the number of inversions of i in this sigma. For instance, one has only one inversion, so the first entry is one. And we just said, 
9 has three inversions, column 4, 5, and 6. So the ninth entry is 3. Now we have a code for each sigma. We can create a polynomial for each sigma. So first, let's consider this sigma again. And let's just remove all these numbers flying above and get an injective tableau. This injective tableau is called T sigma. So we have an injective tableau. We can find its corresponding generalized Benjamin called delta T sigma. For this sigma, we can also find its code. And we can create a monomial that corresponds to this code. In other words, this monomial satisfies the following. The power of xi is the number of inversions of i in sigma. We have a monomial on one hand and a polynomial on the other hand. We let this monomial act on the delta t sigma, and the result is called delta sigma. So notice that this element actually comes from that spanning set mentioned above. So that spanning set was just all these um, delta t's acted by all kinds of mon monomials. So this, of course, is in that spanning set. Well, if we let sigma ranges over all possible ordered set partition, then this set is actually a subset of the spanning set mentioned above. But we can say something more than that. Our ma next main result is saying that if we let sigma ranges over all elements in OP and lambda, then this resulting set is not only a subset of a spanning set, but also a basis. So this is a basis of V and lambda, which means it's a harmonic basis of R and lambda. And this can tell us something about the Hubert series of R and lambda. So up to a reverse, the Hubert series R and lambda is just a generating function of this statistics, which counts the total number of inversions in one sigma. All right. So up to this point, we have studied everything with only one set of variables, x1 to xn. Now what happens if we introduce another set of variables, y1 to yn? So let's define dv and lambda to be the following space. It's the smallest space that contains these delta t's and is closed under not only the x partial derivatives, but also the y partial derivatives. And moreover, we want it to be closed under all these polarization operators. So um, they, we allow higher power of these polarization operators, which means you can put a J here for any positive J. So this is the operator that changes X into Ys. Now we have defined a space called D, V, and lambda. And we can ask, what's the dimension of this D, V, and lambda? What is, uh, can, we, can we find the basis of this D, V, and lambda? Or we can ask, what's the bi-graded Frobenius image of this DV and lambda if viewed as a bi-graded SM modules? Well, Heyman solved this problem for the special case when lambda is a sequence of ones, but the general case is still open. So um, that's all I wanna say. Thank you all. Very nice. Any questions for a speaker? I guess I had a question. So, so this gives a basis for the harmonic. Mm -hmm. Go back a slide or two. Yes. Yeah. Can you translate that into a basis for the original quotient, like a monomial? Oh, sh sure, sure. Whenever we have a harmonic basis like this, um, we can find, uh, we can just create a basis for R and lambda by just project everything. Like I just see, yeah. have, yeah, yeah, just add in plus I and lambda after mm -hmm. that. So that's a set of cosets. They form a basis of R and lambda. So that's why people are saying that this is a harmonic basis of R and lambda, even though it's a real basis for, for V and lambda. Yeah. Is there, an easy, is there a similarly easy way to go back? I'm sorry, what? Is there a similarly easy way to go back from a basis of the quotient to a harmonic basis? Uh, I don't think there is an easy way to go backwards. Mm -hmm. 
while this theorem is, is lying around, this is an harmonic basis. It, it means that you're not considering the derivatives. Derivatives are built in. So actually, if you want a linear basis, it's complicated to uh, find which derivatives you should keep and not, and those you shouldn't. Mm -hmm. So this is just a seed at the top, in a sense. I see. Mm -hmm. So I've already, <clears throat> I think I've already asked Brendan this before, you, so you might have to remind me. Uh -huh. um, your inversion statistic works really well when you want to take the limit as s goes to infinity. And uh, uh -huh. I'm wondering if there's a nice basis for um, like the harmonics of that ring too. Um, so you are idea. talking you about- the, When you get rid of the variable powers, and just okay, so that's the same as saying lambda now is a huge, um, it's a super long partition followed by a whole bunch of zeros. Yeah. Well, I guess, um, let's see. Uh, I'm not sure about that. Because it seems like um, if S is super long, then this, um, based on this inversion statistics, this um, the, the one of the code will be will, will can can increase, right? Yeah, yeah. If if the number is like lies above the boxes, then that then then its inversion number can be super large, which means um, I just don't have a very nice basis for that. Do you have any thoughts that that last problem you posed, future directions? Oh, um, Do you have any thoughts that maybe for different lambdas you could use McDonald polynomial operators or something? Um, no ideas. Okay. <laughs> I think it's even kind of open to connect uh, Sean's rings directly with these delta operators and so forth. So. Right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Well, great. Uh, let's thank our speaker again.